thanks everyone else for joining. It's my pleasure to be in conversation today um, with Dr. Dory Tunstall. How are you doing? I'm good, how are you? I'm well, thank you, yeah, yeah. Sat in uh, air conditioning here in Brooklyn as it is roasting and sunny outside. Um, I mean, I, I wish we could do these things uh, in person and I think, yeah, it'd be a lovely day to be doing that here in New York. How are you getting on? Uh, it is a very gray day here in Toronto, <laughs> but uh, still requiring the air conditioning. Um, but it would be lovely, lovely, lovely to be able to be in New York or anywhere. We're, we're coming out of lockdown, um, but we're still, um, it's, it's, it's still a little bit of time before we're able to really travel freely. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way. Um, but how's life in Toronto in general? You feel you're coming out of lockdown, things are getting back to some semblance of normality? Yes. <laughs> we're, we're just waiting for wave four. <laughs> I, I kind of feel like that over here. <laughs> I mean, the truth is, actually, we have the one of the highest uh, vaccination rates in the city of Toronto, um, pretty much in North America. We're, we're hovering around you know, like 80, 85%, if not higher. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's, it's all good when it's just you and then it's only a challenge when you start opening things back up, right? Yeah, no, I, I understand that. I mean, that's kind of the feeling in New York at the moment as well. I think we're, I think our rates are pretty good in the city, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, and I guess that's one of the reasons why they're bringing in these um, policies, I suppose, to sort of limit number of people who are going to be coming here without being vaccinated but mm -hmm. anyway well, how about have you been attending virtual conferences and 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 living that academic best life but vir through the virtual mediums or yeah and it and, and it's increased my um participation more because i i feel like now i'm doing a sort of a keynote or a panel at least uh every week if not every other week um, and some some weeks it's two weeks. Um, and so because, you know, traveling would mean like there's a day that I'm out of loop and then there's a day coming back, I'm out of loop. And when I'm there, I'm there. I actually, um, you know, that limits your uh, your participation. But now since I don't have to get out of my kitchen, you know, you can just stack one after the other. <laughs> It's not jet lag anymore, it's screen lag, isn't it? You know, it's, uh, <laughs> Zoom fatigue. Zoom fatigue. I, you know, I used to travel a lot to conferences all over the world. Um, and now, I, like you, I'm attending more than ever. And I mean, that is kind of a benefit or a silver lining. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm in my bedroom today. My, my wife's got the, the, the living room. So, you know, <laughs> the trials and tribulations of, of, of modern academic life. Um, all right, so you're, you're, you're in Toronto, but you're, you're the dean. Faculty of Design at OCAD, right? Yeah, which is still in Toronto. So Ontario College of Art and Design University um, in Tokaranto, uh, using the Indigenous name for it. And what does an average day as a dean look like for you? What kind of, <laughs> stuff, what kind of stuff are you getting up to? Um, I say it, it it's organizes its... So everything's a meeting. So I go to meetings, to meetings, to talks, to meetings. And I say this, that I explain to people because my job is to meet with people. And when I meet with people, there's normally three things I'm trying to figure out. What is it that you want? Yeah. Uh, how, did I ca how can I provide it? Uh, if, I, if it's something I can't do. And if I can't do it, who can I connect you to that might be able to help and assist you? So those, those are my meetings is every day we have... On an average day, I'll have five to six meetings ranging from like 45 minutes to, uh, to um, an hour or half hour in some cases, depending on how busy the day is. But um, my, as a dean, my, my job is to create the conditions of possibility for other people to do what they need to do and to be able to support that. So a lot of my job is committee meetings um, where we discuss and make decisions or a meeting with individual faculty, meeting with students, meeting with community uh, members, meeting with industry, just whomever I can connect people to the institution um, in a way that uh, helps, again, move everything forward. 
Well, look, that's a very uh, eloquent and positive way of putting it. Normally, when I ask that question of a dean, they're like, I'm an administrator and I can't wait to get out of this position. So <laughs> I, that, that's a really nice way of putting it. I like that. Um, you know, you, well, you're it's an not nice. You know, it's a, it's a thing where, like, you, you, truly, you truly design the conditions of possibility, right? That you're the one who has to mobilize the resources if, need, if they're needed. You're the one who, again, has to help find the people yes. or support the you know my chairs and program leaders to find the people if they need someone to do something so for me it it's really is de, you know like designing the conditions of possibility if if i if i don't help set things up for people for them to be successful mm -hmm. um for them to be well balanced in some ways then um then it makes their jobs much more difficult right yeah and what what are the most rewarding aspects of the of the role then is is it that creating space for people to to kind of like do them and to, to you know to, to to enable these possibilities and to I suppose affect some real change um which we're going to get into it's uh, yeah. I, I, so I mean I've been thinking about um, a couple of things I've, I've read about you recently and I've, I can see that you're really making some positive moves which is great to see um but are you also like you, you've just, we got also we're going to talk today um, about the 20th anniversary issue of Intellects Art Design Communication in Higher Yay! Education. Um, just want to congratulate Susan Orr and all the editorial team for this monumental landmark. Um, but what uh, what a, what a pleasure it was um, to have you guest edit that special issue. And we're going to talk about the theme and we're going to get into that in a minute. But it seems like you're still able to do some research. You're still able to write. Um, are you, do you still teach? It's, just, it's not just all admin and enabling. <laughs> yeah, uh, this this year's the first this the first academic year I'm not teaching because I taught two courses this year. Uh, so I generally teach every year. It's really important for me in terms of staying connected to again what's the main purpose of a university, right? Is to impart uh, knowledge and information. So I always teach every year. Uh, and then, um, and, I, and again, from a research, what I've been really focusing on is helping people understand this process of decolonizing yeah. uh, art and design education. So right now I'm in the middle of, of writing a book um, about um, some of the things that we've done at OCAD and going deeper into like the, the deep theoretical and experiential um, aspects of uh, that have informed the work that we've been doing at OCAD. So yesterday we just announced uh, the outcomes of our indigenous cluster hire, our second indigenous cluster hire. Um, and so, um, so I do, I do a lot, but they're all in synergy with one another. So I never feel really fractured. Like whatever I'm teaching is related to what we're trying to do in terms of change the organization and the institution. I draw upon the relationships that I have in industry and community to feed into all of that. So, um, so I'm able to do a lot because um, nothing's pulling me in multiple directions. They're all heading in the same direction. Well, um, I wanted to congratulate you on uh, on that. I was peeping your Instagram, um, and I, I did notice the, the hashtag um, Indigenous OCAD. Um, tell us a little bit about that hiring cluster and what you're trying to achieve there, because I think it's really important that we highlight that. Yeah, OCAD University has had Indigenous faculty for close to 15 years. Um, and then the last uh, five years or so, we've been just trying to build critical mass as part of our decolonization. So to understand about decolonization and Indigenous relationships to the land and processes, um, you have to have Indigenous faculty to be able to um, bring into the institution that understanding, that lived experience, that ways of knowing. So in the last five years, we've had two Indigenous cluster hires. One, um, the first one brought in five new Indigenous faculty, and the second one has brought in another five Indigenous faculty. And that was joining what was then, I think, 16. And between now, we probably have, I have we haven't done like the full last count, but about 20, 20 or so indigenous faculty um, at OCAD, which is really amazing across art and design and arts and sciences, which um, is so amazing because it allows us to do more outreach into indigenous communities to increase the number of our indigenous students. 
Um, we have an uh, Indigenous Education Council, uh, which is made up of sort of Indigenous leaders throughout uh, North America. And we've, uh, we're building a council of, of elders. <laughs> um, there's this wonderful woman, Nadia McLaren, who's kind of our community um, engagement, Indigenous community engagement coordinator. And so we've been doing a lot of work around transforming our institution and preparing our institution to be transformed um, by surrounding ourselves with sort of indigenous community both inside and around us so that we can do we can uh in the anishinaabe that we can walk the right path right that we can walk the right path together well again congratulations i think and, and congratulations to ocad would you would you say that it's a fairly progressive um institution as far as academic institutions can be um that's that's good to hear um yeah nice. i mean it you know we're lucky because we're in a city like toronto which is really diverse so you get um a lot of the pressure comes from our community itself and um again we're an art and design institution so we we are open to creativity we're open to different ways of knowing and in our practices in and of itself, like, you know, we're about the visual and making and oral and performance and all these sort of things that kind of take you out of that traditional academic realm, which has been, um, I'd say that indigenous engagement with that particular ways of knowing and being have been so harmful. So because we're art and design, so we kind of approach things differently, it's been easier for us to embrace these ideals, embrace these principles, and again, bring the communities uh, with us. It's, um, it's interesting that you did mention um, the location of being in Toronto as being quite important to that process. Um, is, is that because there's a, a number of indigenous communities based there, or, or and obviously the, tr the, the traditions um, yeah, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Or like, yeah, so right just down the lake is um, the Six Nations, uh, which it, when we think of the Iroquois Confederacy, like that's the Six Nations. And so it's really interesting, right? Because when we talk about things like um, seventh generation, when we talk about the seven grandfather teachings, those are not abstractions for us because that is like, you know, that happened down the street. <laughs> That's very real, and those principles are very real, and how they're lived out are very real. So for us, we're quite fortunate to be in a place where there's a strong indigenous community that we can directly engage with, that we can, can you know, we can bring our students to the land yeah. in a way that, um, again, makes it more tangible, makes it more real, which makes it easier for our community to be able to embrace. Would you say that's an important part of your teaching practices and, and, and kind of the practices of the university, that integration between the institution and the local communities? Is that a big yeah, we're working. I mean, you know, we're, we're working more closely and carefully in terms of being able to do that. I, I would say we've really we've again, we've had long term relationships, I think, on the level of individual faculty members. But what we've been working um, quite diligently on in the last five years is building those relationships at the institutional level, right? So that regardless of a faculty member or regardless of an administrator in the role, that as, you know, people shift, move and whatever, those relationships don't get broken, that the institution has a deep enough relationship itself that it continues. And so that's what we've really been working on is kind of stabilizing and deepening those relationships with again diverse communities um so you know i've been we've been doing a lot of work with indigenous community but you know part of the work that i've i brought in with ocad when i came was um deepening the relationship with the various black community here in in, in toronto and so year before last we had our black cluster hire to bring in five full-time black uh, faculty members at, um, in the faculty of design. And um, that doubled the number of black faculty in one year. So we've been doing this kind of work where, again, building critical mass um, so that the work can happen, can be accelerated, right? Can be accelerated. It's, it, seem, it seems to me, I mean, I've had the fortune of visiting many universities all over the world. 
um, over many years now. Um, so some, yeah, you know, there's, there's stark issues that I've been that I've encountered, um, and and but it seems that OCAD is perhaps like a real success story. And I sound, I'm sure there's a long way to go, but it sounds like this is a good model um, that many universities around the world should be looking at and, and you know, using as a, a, a you know, to set their own objectives. Um, exactly. And, and so we've been working really hard to, to document what we've done. So this is, that's part of writing the book. Uh, there's a course that I teach in our continuing studies called Hiring for Decolonization, Diversity and Inclusion. And so we've, I've taught that, you know, I taught it in the fall, I've taught it in the summer, we'll teach it again in the fall, just so that we can help um, other institutions learn from what we've done so that they can move faster, right? So they can, they can accelerate their, those processes. And it's been quite um, transformative for uh, other institutions. <laughs> um, you know, they'll come in with our calls that we do, our job calls, and they'll come in to their administrators and say, we can do this. And, and we're seeing it like the University of um, Ottawa just announced they're going to do a 10 person black cluster hire and a 10 and a 10 person indigenous cluster hire, you know, over the next three years. Uh, RISD is, you know, doing their Black Cluster Hire. So um, a lot of the uh, places now see doing that as low risk. <laughs> Administratively, everything's really important in terms of being low risk. Mm -hmm. Beginning to see this as low risk. And because we've had some success with it, other institutions are more confident that they can be successful as well. So that seems like an epochal shift. Like that's, that. Um, if you noticed a big, um, change and transition in recent years, and especially in terms of this idea of, of those kind of hiring being being low risk. Um, is, is this is this recent? Do you think is this a recent change? I would say it's been accelerated by the events of last summer in terms of the greater focus on Black Lives Matter through the sort of response and protest to the murder of George Floyd. Um, the right now, the big controversy that's going on here in Canada is the discovery of the bodies of children who, um, um, who, you know, died in residential schools. Um, and so then there's been a really strong effort now again to provide resources and to, um, to engage with indigenous ways of knowing and being in histories. Um, that, again, it's finding another resurgence um, as we go into that. So there's all these, because COVID has still slowed us down in terms of being able to pay greater attention to things that are going on in the world, there's that people are wanting to do better, um, have a lot of the work this year has been building the infrastructure to allow people to do better and and right now people are in their implementation like they did all their planning last year now everyone's going into their implementation phases of the plans that they've made and it's in both in industry as well as in academia there's some amazing shifts that you never imagined you know could happen so you know um that a lot of I follow a lot of indigenous and um, black and POC businesses and you know like um, Safara right is bringing in you know indigenous makeup businesses okay. and supporting this and um, there's the 15% challenge where um, large companies are um, are meant to pledge to have 15% of their you know of their business be for uh, black entrepreneurs or black businesses. So there's all these things that are, again, not just planning, but are actually in motion. That makes you feel <laughs> things are possible. Like there's a, there's a shift in our zeitgeist that we just need to make sure we keep pushing um, the sort of progressive agenda in terms of real, real structural change, right? Real structural change. I, I mean, yeah, I completely agree with you, and I feel like in my in my lifetime, this is the first real zeitgeist change um, that I can really remember. And also, it, and like you say, it's it's actual change, um, and people have you know, it's 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 less about statements and words, and more about actions, and 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 I think that's that's a great shift. And so we we must all continue to strive for that.
Um, but let's, uh, I'm, we'll get into the issue in a minute. But um, I did want to ask you a little bit about, about your trajectory. I mean, okay. um, fascinating as I believe it will be. We, uh, you're, obviously, you're Dean there, Faculty of Design. So you're a design educator. Um, mm -hmm. But then also you, you're obviously um, very, uh, in, indigenous studies is I suppose integral to your research um, and to what your work is there as a Dean um, at OCAD. So just tell us a little bit about your history. How did you become an educator? How did you fall into the murky depths of academia? Um, you, you know, and, 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 and how did you become the Dean? You know, what's, uh, what's the story? Um, well, I guess my background is actually in anthropology, which is why the sort of decolonization indigenous ways of knowing is really important, because in many cases, as an anthropologist, you're trying to um, amplify indigenous ways of knowing and being in the world. And so that goes back, you know, <laughs> too many years, but it's okay. I've earned every all of my years, but too many years uh, in terms of really um, Again, how do you connect with different ways of knowing and different ways of being and create space for that? And then for me, the, the, the em emphasis on design is that the ways in which we make those differences tangible is by the things that we design, right? So I, you know, the design of a round table versus a square table, uh, the design of a space, design of, you know, we talk about <laughs> even in anthropology, the first things that you learn is kind of like, what are the cooking materials that people use and where do they place them and what does it mean? And, and all these things that the material culture um, that's produced, all of that is design and for design and by design. So, um, so I worked in high tech consulting and <laughs> trying to figure out, you know, why 2K, what this newfangled internet thing was going to mean to the ways in which people work. Um, and, but also, again, trying to understand, like, how that relates to the ways in which people were already working. And then went into academia because I started working with um, AIGA's Design for Democracy. Yeah. So I was doing high-tech consulting with uh, Sapient Corporation, again, the height of the dot-com boom. Uh, and then uh, went over to ARC Worldwide, which did integrated media for Leo Burnett and the publicist system. So again, learning more and more how to make uh, how to make the things that we make, the things that we communicate more relevant for people and fitting into their lives, not just disruptive, but fitting into their lives, fitting into their values. Um, decided to go back to academia because everyone kept asking me, how do I do what you do as a design anthropologist in industry? And there weren't really the programs to help do that. So I started at University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, building sort of units in like user experience research, um, building units and sort of culturally based design. Decided to go to Australia. <laughs> yeah, and then just uh, on the it seems to be a bit of a hub over there. Yeah, um, to work at Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne. And that's where I really like decolonizing design became really important. So I've always had like a design and social justice angle. But there, the language around decolonization, the, the, you know, the practices of indigenous uh, acknowledgement, the practices of rec reconciliation, all of that was really important um, that I learned. And so we built a program in design anthropology with a specialization in indigenous knowledge, which was taught by all indigenous faculty, including in, um, Bunurong Elder, um, so shout out to Awit Carolyn. <laughs> um, and, um, and so because I had that experience, OCAD, when they called, they were calling for a dean who could help them with, I think the term they use is decolonization and indigenous revitalization. And I had had already, you know, six experiences and six years of experience in how to do that in Australia. So um, my family was wanting me to come back to North America because 20 hour flight is really far. Um, and so I uh, applied, I got the job and it's been really bliss on tap in terms of just the community being ready for the kind of changes that um, it means to decolonize. Again, having a, 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 com a community that would be supportive when you reach out to them and connect with them. And, um, and again, just feeling every day grateful that 
Uh, we've been able to do uh, so much. And, you know, in, in the field of like 145, 146 years, it feels really slow. But in the, in the context of what we've done in the last five or six years, things have changed completely. And, and the thing about building critical mass is that they won't go back. They'll never go back to those other ways of thinking and being that we will move forward with this new understanding of what it means to be a, a maker, right, in the world. Wonderful. Um, thanks for giving us a, the, the <laughs> that take on, on your own experience. Um, I think a couple of, you know, just, just, just coming to mind here, many of the designers that work with us at Intellect, it's, uh, or design academics, I should say, it's clear that they've also worked um, in industry before they became educators. Do you think that's quite important in, in the field of design? And I think it's something which is definitely um, unifying maybe research and, and reality. Um, and of course, that, that's very much, I think, very important in, um, in Indigenous studies, I suppose, as well, just in the fact that uh, it's about people representing themselves, right, and not being represented. Um. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, people, the, you know, the other answer to what it is that I do is that I take all the tools that I learned as a consult, high tech consultant around like, how do you facilitate? How do you build consensus? How to use design thinking to kind of move through sort of the vision and implementation of a process? Like all of that I do as my dean. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So we build personas, we uh, do project mapping. Uh, I'm, the, when I first came in, uh, they put a stack of uh, post-it notes and Sharpies on my desk just to, as a part of the welcome to me. A, little, um, a, little bit of a, a bit of Mickey taking perhaps as we'd say over here in, uh, in England. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's one of those things I think, um, the connection to industry is important because we need, you know, like, as an educator, the students are always asking us, what's the value of what we're learning and how is that going to be relevant in the future? <laughs> so the connection to industry is so important because it gives you a sense of like what it is that they might be needing, what might be shifting for them um, so that you can prepare students in some ways to, to interface with them with as much preparation um, and of what they can expect or should expect, but also how they can contribute. Because again, um, our students are pushing the boundaries of what is possible just because in some ways they, they don't really believe these boundaries exist in a way that when you're out in industry, some of those boundaries become really hard because there's money attached to them and resources attached to them. So, so in some ways, the community connection, the industry connection is so important to making sure that we can help students articulate what, what it is they're doing and how it's relevant to the kinds of challenges that are being, um, that industry is facing and, and it's constant change and having to adapt. Um, then I think the other part is, again, community is important. That connection to community is important because our students, and, and this is really, really strong at OCAD, is that, you know, they, they want to, they come from diverse communities. And sometimes, like, the, the communities, you know, don't understand what they do as, a, like, a designer or definitely don't understand what they do as an artist. <laughs> and so when you're connected community directly, then it helps them show the value of what it is that they're doing because it adds value to the community in terms of it, its ability to express itself, to its ability to be um, self-sustaining if it's more the entrepreneurial side. Mm -hmm. So there's all this work that has to be done that the university is not an ivory tower that's separated. It actually is part of society. It's part of the city. It's part of these communities. And it just has a different role. Like what I love about um, being in university is that we are the ultimate convener. So we can convene, I can convene people from industry, the community, nonprofit, small profit, education. We can bring them all together in a room in a way that um, other institutions um, in a city may not because we're seen as neutral, right? right. We're seen as neutral. Our vested interest is in everyone succeeding um, so it's a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful opportunity to really 
make a difference in the places that you're at um, when you're in the university. And so you shouldn't ever be separate, shouldn't ever be separate. And, and we don't want, neither are, I always say the key performance indicator for me is um, how entitled our different communities feel to our resources. So, you know, pre-COVID, everyone's like, we need the Great Hall for X, Y, and Z. Um, can we have it on this particular date? And we don't want to pay for this and we don't want to pay for that. So that sense of entitlement in some ways is a marker that they see you as part of their community resources. Um, and, uh, and that's how you want to be as an institution in a place. Well, I just want to say to everyone who's joining us, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure here to be talking with Dr. Dory Tunstall. Um, we're going to get into a, a, a journal um, issue that she, uh, we, we, uh, that you guest edited for us um, to celebrate the 20th anniversary. But if anyone has any specific questions to put to Dory, do drop them in the comments section, um, and then we'll try and get round to them during this conversation today. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you for joining, and do drop us any questions. But why don't we get into this journal then? So, the 20th anniversary issue of Art Design Communication in Higher Education, ADCHE. Um, fantastic journal, uh, one that I've been proud to be involved with for many years. And thank you, first of all, and congratulations, because the feedback is tremendous so far. Um, so, yeah, tell us a little bit about, about the journal. And I think maybe we can also unpack uh, this idea of what it means to decolonize art and design education. Because obviously, that's a key central theme within the issue itself. So over to you. Yeah. Um, so first, just a, a shout out to uh, Susan, <laughs> inviting me uh, to participate in this. And um, it was really, there was two things that we were wanting to do. Um, first, kind of to have a global perspective on what it was happening in terms of decolonizing art and design education. And second was also to try to uh, to see if we create space in which people would play with the form of how they describe what it is they do in terms of like the structure of the articles itself. And so we were successful in both ways with that. Um, again, we, you know, we have representation um, from, you know, uh, North America, New Zealand, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, <laughs> Uh, we have uh, representation um, from uh, Hong Kong, and then let's see the other places that we are, um, the UK, uh, Brazil. So it was very much a global discussion. And all what we realized again is like decolonizing design means different things in different places. Um, because the histories of colonization is different in every, in every country, right? Um, the response or preparedness of the design institutions, and these are, again, educational institutions to respond to that are quite different. Um, and the push, like, of the students itself for this kind of transformation and change that in different places are at, um, at different levels of having that kind of conversation and opening the space for that kind of student self-advocacy. Um, so it was really, um, it was just really amazing to see in all of these different places, just how far, how far and how relatively quickly the curriculum is changing at different scales. So, you know, like the, the work in um, New Zealand, uh, that was kind of, um, that was written about, um, and again, shout out to uh, Luke Feast, who was one of my PhD students, so there's a direct uh, connection. Um, and Christina Vogels, like they, they're talking about like an entire multi-university level around bringing, you know, um, Maori worldviews into design, right? And that's something that's you know, first year when you come in to the University of Auckland, um, Auckland University of Technology, like that's in the first year, that's what you encounter as your your pathway into understanding design and making. And it's, you know, again, broad, it's it involve multiple students, um, deeply involved with like indigenous community, the Maori community themselves. And so you have something where like, it's at that university scale 
But then you have something that, you know, described like um, what was really interesting about like uh, Dr. Ferreira Al-Mahrahim, uh, that um, the work in Mecca is you get to see the evolution where it's just her kind of pushing these boundaries. But then as she gets into teaching, setting up projects that encourage the students to begin to do this work and do this research on the, their own architectural practices in the cities where they, the, they grew up and documenting it. And um, again, showing how important it is, um, collecting family stories around it, and then, um, and then becoming more institutionalized because as the students go into different fields, whether it's in industry or going into education, again, taking those lessons, creating more platform for students to learn, um, or again, government it, um, bodies to learn how to value the traditional architecture of Mecca, right? So you have these different scales of the, of the story, all about, um, I guess, you know, decolonization is about a few things. Number one, it's about land. Right. So the land and the resources of the land and what is the relationship of the original indigenous people to that land? And do they have sovereignty over the land? Do they have control over the resources? And if they don't, what's the process by which that is being made to happen um, through political efforts, through cultural efforts, et cetera? Um, so that's what decolonization is. And then how it relates to design is, again, people understanding how to position themselves. So there's a way in which the story we tell of design is like, this is something that happened in the 1800s in Europe, reached its pinnacle in the Bauhaus. <laughs> right. um, and that's just, you know, that's the history of making in one place. Um, and so part of it, of decolonization is, um, Again, making sure that that story of design is just the story of a particular lineage of design. Um, and in some ways, it's like the mythologies around that, once you start looking deeper, don't really follow. Like, you know, uh, the better progress through technology didn't benefit everyone. <laughs> uh, universal humankind didn't benefit everyone. Not everyone was included in that universe. Um, yeah. And even just within the context of Europe itself, right? So, um, so creating spaces for you can talk about the sixty-five thousand years of making of Australian Aboriginal culture, right? You can talk about um, you know like the first invention of sunglasses by the Inuit, maybe twenty to twenty-five thousand years ago, where you begin to talk about these the the create space in which you can have a diversity of making and there's no hierarchy between them. That's, that's helping to prepare the world for decolonization. Because if the end goal of decolonization is, is the ability for everyone to live under indigenous sovereignty, which means living under indigenous principles and ways of knowing and being, then by creating that space in our educational institutions, again, you know, like what excites me the most is OCAD might be a place where it's like, if you want to understand what it means to live under indigenous sovereignty and to feel good about that experience, to not feel anxious about that experience, then you come to OCAD because that is what your experience will be. And you will come out in four years and not feel threatened by indigenous sovereignty not feel threatened by the multiplicities of ways of being and making in the world and knowing your position within that. So that's what decolonization is really about. <laughs> but there's a lot of preparation that has to happen to get people to feel um, comfortable about those spaces, being in those spaces and places. Oh, I'm very well put. And I think it's something that maybe people misconstrue what well, uh, decolonization is all about so I thank you for sharing your thoughts on that with us and I can see that this is an important process towards that um, and and again again I just like the idea of you talking about design as being such an effective tool to make these kind of changes and to broaden people's perspectives uh, and I've read many things that you've you've 
people have said and written about um, about design being that kind of enabling factor. Um, we've got to have a question. Let me just see what we've got going on. Uh, hello, Dory. I have a question about the struggle on how can we sorry help it. Oh, I didn't change it. Can you read that, Dory? Do you see that? Yeah, help others change the experience by being from different locations and backgrounds, and so backgrounds of oppression. So I, I, I think I think um, so. One of the things is really important is to talk about like nested oppressions. <laughs> Um, because again, all of this, all, you know, as I say, very few of us know what decolonization is, what that experience is. We are in the process of making that happen, which means um, we are making a lot of mistakes, that we are continuing to hurt one another. And what's really important coming from like an anti-oppressive framework is to listen when people say they're being hurt, um, accept your responsibility for that hurt, even if it was not your intention. And then to listen again of how you can make amends, what you can do to repair those relations. And it's, it's, it takes a tremendous amount of humility. One of the things that I'm learning, like I, I get... I get called out so many times. <laughs> As like one of the challenges of being in a position of of of, of sort of high visibility, yeah. um, and to try to be really out there is that I get called out all the time, and and there's, you know, my immediate thing is to like defend myself, and it's like I have to say no. I'm gonna take a step I back. I have to listen to this person's pain. I have to acknowledge that, regardless of what my intention is, that I've caused pain, and then sort of again, acknowledge that and say, what is it that you need? What is it that I can do to make you feel that I've recognized your pain and that we can begin a journey of healing? And to me, the good thing is that people um, trust me enough that they will call me out. <laughs> um, and I'm beginning to trust myself enough to know that I won't go off the handle, that I'll sort of stop, <laughs> process, deflate the ego um, and um, and work really, really hard to build those kinds of relationships. And so the connection that you have community, like why it's important to build relationship to community is that they will hold you accountable. Like again, that sense of entitlement is also a, a method of accountability. Yeah. And so if you, um, if you want to be in community, if you want to be in communion, you have to um, listen, right? You have to listen to and hold yourself accountable for, for what you do and for what you don't do as well. And so right now, like I said, the reckoning that we're having here in Canada is that <clears throat> um, the institutions that have caused and continue to cause harm to indigenous communities, again, they're, they're beginning to only acknowledge what it is that they've done, um, but they're not doing the work to make amends or they're doing the, the bare minimum, which doesn't address the, the structural um, processes and institutions and, that are in place that continues to pass that harm into future generations. I mean, brilliantly put again. Um, yeah, thank, thank, thanks for those explanations. I think that's fantastic. And real, real world explanations as well. So mm -hmm. I think we need to put you, uh, you need to keep doing a keynote every week. You need to keep putting <laughs> more and more people. You know, I know a few people who could definitely benefit from a quick chat with you, I think, anyway. So, yeah, uh, th thank you again for your time um, and for explaining these, these things to us and to, yeah, to, to, to sort of demythologizing some of these notions around design and education and, um, you know, decolonization. Um, while we're still talking about the, the journal, is there anything else you'd like to highlight from the issue? Because um, I know some, I, I mean, I think this, there's all these different approaches in these different articles. Mm -hmm and mm -hmm. global perspectives. Um, and I mean, you've kind of already highlighted some of that, but is there anything else you'd like to, to, to bring up about that? Yeah, like for me, what was, 
and I, I sort of uh, we posted on this before, but like what it was so exciting to me is to see how much it's being driven by the students themselves. And there's kind of two examples in the article. So there's the the work that was done by the University of Washington, Seattle. Mm -hmm. And what was brilliant is that like the article itself was written by the students. Like, again, they had support. And so um, and so what they're doing is they're doing this multi narrative of their experiences of taking their course. Um, and the course was called World Building, Creating Alternative Worlds Through Meaningful Making in Undergraduate Education. So again, definitely centered on some of the thematics. And, um, you know, and so Nat Mengist was the sort of centered student, but then there was other student perspectives that were doing that. And so to hear, to read their perspective on why these kinds of transformations are important, why Again, diverse student body. So how they bring their own histories into their understanding um, is really, it was really uh, just so moving to read, right? And again, a similar work um, that was, again, happening in another place in the world where you have um, Raffaella Angelon's essay about uh, monster aesthetics and expressions of the decolonial and design body that was taking place in Brazil. And just, again, trying to use more body politics, uh, uh, festival, carnival, um, again, tying to sort of Brazilian traditions of expression and the way in which um, in these carnivalesque moments that they play with identity. Um, so, you know, that to, to have, to hear the students' perspectives in that and how they really, again, pushed forward the agenda to make it, to make their education more accountable to who they are and what their history should be and, and away from this sort of um, European um, notion of, of what design is and what makes good design and, and to tie it, again, to their own sort of real politics. Um, that again, the, 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 the youth are leading, <laughs> the youth are leading and they're pushing, they're pushing us as faculty and administrators to, um, to really give them an education that is liberatory, right? To give them an education that will liberate them to help them understand systems of oppression and the educational institution as a system of oppression in and of itself, right? Mm -hmm. And and to give them the tools to be able to critically think and critically make um, in a world where um, the values of respect, the values of like sustainability and connectivity, inter interdependency, Mm -hmm. um, that all of those things um, are what drives how we make in the world, right? And by making these things real and tangible in the world, we make them real in the world. Like, <laughs> these are not abstractions. These are not just theoretical paradigms that you put on a sheet. They're real practices of change. And it's the youth who are leading those changes. Well, and there's some changes that we certainly need, and I'm I'm just glad to see that they're they're coming from the next generation. Um, mm -hmm. um, I was just going to say to anyone who's there at OCAD, um, o who's tuning in, OCAD has uh, full access to all of Intellect's 108 peer-reviewed academic journals, including Art Design Communication in Higher Education, which. Dory has just done the 20th anniversary issue, which I believe is 20.1. Um, so. You can get that. So read this stuff, guys. Like if you if you're tuning in Mocad or many other universities, it's definitely worth just typing it, typing in some search terms because you may well have access. And I know that you do at Ocad. Um, but in the spirit of the conversation we're having today, we'll also be making the issue freely available um, at some point in the near future. So everyone, can, so it'll be it won't be open access forever, but it will be open and accessible for a period of time so again just keep an eye out on uh, the intellect social media and we'll definitely be celebrating the issue the 20th anniversary and we're doing a lot around that but mainly focusing on of course on dory's fantastic issue so again thank you and congratulations on what
wonderful um, contribution to the field um, and to into Intellect's uh, back catalog. So you know, thank you. It's been a pleasure. So thank you. It's been it's been such a great. So let's let's do it again. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, well, I've got a few more questions for you though. Um, sure. Before I let you go today, um, we've got one in. Oh, we've got one in from the audience. You see that one? Uh, just see if Peter Scott's research digitalization within design education to this journalist. Okay, great, wonderful. Um, yeah, great to see people are actually um, engaging with the content or will be, and that they're involved in, in doing PhD and these kinds of things. Um, but you know, obviously, you've become you've become famous for this design anthropology um, and for your impact as a result of that, and 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 of course, this idea of decolonizing design education or design art and design education um, but a lot of people probably first encountered that or perhaps even yourself when you were speaking at the uh, the AIGA design conference in 2016 <laughs> yeah. um, and 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 you you wrote me a, a wonderful little paragraph explaining that um, so yeah I wanted to just ask you that same question that, that I asked you previously um, so you can you know you can you can you can tell us all about it. So, how do you feel about the process of decolonizing design education um, since you spoke at that uh, conference? Because I believe you maybe ruffled a few feathers. Um, you oh and you. yes. <laughs> Tell a little bit about what what went down at the conference. Why it was so important that you and your colleagues, uh, you know, made those pronouncements, and and, ha and and have things changed? You know, I mean, it, it sounds very positive from what you're saying, but yeah. So, how have things changed since you um, shook things up in 2016? Um, I think, it, you know, it's one of those things that, particularly in the United States, right? And, and for me, it was a little bit of, of cultural shock coming from Australia, where, again, there's a really strong language and decourse around decolonization. There's a really strong understanding of, like, indigenous ways of knowing being. And then coming back to North America, where, again, in Canada was fine, but in the States, um, I remember... Um, because I was, what was really important for me in the way that people had, you know, mostly white men have opened up the platform for me to be able to build, you know, like my uh, career. So like shout out to, you know, Rick Griffey of AIGA in terms of like making sure that I always had a platform to share the ideals that I thought were important. And so when I came back to North America, I wanted to make sure that I was using my platform to open up spaces, particularly for indigenous um, designers. And so Sadie, Sadie Redwing, who we've just officially hired, <laughs> um, and uh, Neven Selfall were uh, two people that I invited into this, into this conversation around decolonizing design. And we, you know, again, decolonizing, we wanted to do things differently. So, you know, Sadie did a, a, a um, smudging process we had these videos from like, you know, the Latinx perspective, from, you know, like the white perspective, from the uh, uh, um, um, Asian perspective and black perspective, all sort of saying like, we all have these different relationships to design, which is actually not, is a little bit harmful. Like a, we've been hurt by design. And so I think that the community was not quite ready to hear that message in that way. Um, I think, um, yeah, and, and so, like I said, I actually ended up pulling back a little bit from AIGA after that. Um, but again, now, you know, like I see, and, you know, there is not, in any of the AIGA conferences, there is, um, that decolonization is, is, it's front and center. Diversity and inclusion is front and center. And so there's a, a complete shift in some ways where, you know, <laughs> that it felt before that, you know, even in 2016, it was still about like the accomplishments of great white male and female, like the gender equity in that sense was well, you know, um, designers. <laughs> um, but now they've really um, created a very broad platform, a very broad platform with again, strong, but and that's due to the hard work of of people working within AIGA and pushing them and holding them accountable um, to create more space for uh, different perspectives on designing. And and also I give a special shout out for Ion Design because they were one is one of the first ones. I think like the two magazines that were like 
on top of this pretty early on, it was like communication arts and um, an eye on design. And so through that vehicle, they kept pushing the discussion, they kept pushing the discussion so that like, again, now, you know, and, and more people being involved. So again, that first cohort, like Sadie was everywhere <laughs> because everyone was like, we need to have an indigenous perspective. Right. But now there's more indigenous designers. So Sadie doesn't have to be the only one who's doing all of this particular work, right? And, um, and so it's been really exciting to see that the conversation is not just expanded within the North American design institutions. You have like, Mark Rutledge, who's the first head of like the Graphic Designers of Canada, so the first Indigenous um, head of that. So you have all these firsts of happening that's about diverse peoples moving into positions of leadership of these yeah. institutions and therefore allowing them to change. So I've been, I've been super thrilled, super thrilled because, um, you know, like I, I always say it's like, Every time I get asked to do something, I have like a Rolodex of people to say, oh no, let's go talk to this person, talk to this person, talk to Mark Rutledge, talk yes. to, you know, um, Silas Monroe, talk to so-and-so because there's so many people who are doing this work um, that again, you know, I can use my platform to give them a platform as well. Well, um, speaking of which, I think we should again, like acknowledge uh, the importance that you've had um, in creating these roles as well, just from the just from the perspective of uh, according to Wikipedia anyway. So I hope I'm not getting this wrong, but um, I believe that you're the first black person at the uh, who's no first black woman who is the head or the dean of a faculty of design. So you've obviously had an, an integral and important you know, part in making that change, and then of course through your role um, enabling other people, you know, creating creating these positions for other people. So you know. I think we all owe you a debt of gratitude as well, even you know, for the small part that you've played. You know, so. well, I mean, you know, it's like, a, I, there's, you know, the phrase, I am because we are. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there are so many people who've uh, championed me, who've sponsored me, who's, again, given me platforms to be able to, um, you know, the thing about being the first is that you make sure you're never the only. <laughs> <laughs> And um, and being the first means that no one else actually has to be the first again. That whatever barriers that were in place that kept others from being the first, that then you work really hard to eliminate those barriers. And I only can do that because I have a supportive community, right, who are is willing to see those barriers, listen to those barriers, and remove those barriers when I explain to them in some ways how much harm they've been causing. And so... So I am because we are, I'm happy to represent, I'm happy to amplify, you know, like, and I'm, I'm super grateful for the trust and the, the way in which people feel both inspired and aspire to some of the things that I've been privileged to be able to do. But again, you can only do these things because you have such a supportive community around you. Well, again, beautifully put. <laughs> so thank you for your, your comments on that too. Uh, we're, we're running out of time, but I did want to ask you a few, maybe just a, a few fun questions. Um, I guess so anyway. Um, so what are you, are you, you, what are you currently reading? Anything exciting? Um, um, let's see, Indigenomics uh, by um, Caroline. Caroline, what's Caroline's last name? <laughs> I just forgot her last name. Um, Indigenomics, look that up. Um, I mean, it's again, because I'm writing the book, I'm reading a lot of uh, different stuff. And I'm, I'm going, you know, I'm going back into like my old blogs. Like um, I rediscovered that it, back in 2007, I was writing about like how in the context of like the Bauhaus, because I was talking about a trip that I did to Um, that in the, in the context of a place like Um, you'll understand why the Bauhaus was really important and, and how revolutionary it would be in the context of like, you know, Bavarian German culture, right? But then what does that mean when that gets imported to the United States or Canada or Australia or any of these other places and it becomes part of colonization, right? So I've been doing, um, so I've been reading lots of articles and lots of books. 
Um, so I'm not reading anything for fun, but I'm reading things to kind of undergird all of the work that I've been doing into the real scholarship that sort of says um, how deep it goes, right? How deep it goes. But I definitely recommend Indigenomics. Uh, I would recommend uh, Black, Brown, uh, Designers uh, by, I'm like, I'm totally not prepared to tell you books references. Yeah, <laughs> There's so also, go, go check my Instagram feed. I'll put, I'll put a list. <laughs> I would recommend anyone does that anyway. Um, there's plenty of good stuff on there. Um, but we've got a, a, an audience member, Thomas, has just said, I don't mean, not the, the, uh, the, sorry, the author's name, but the full title is Indigenomics, Taking a Seat at the Economic Table. Um, yes, think, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. That's cool. Um, and in terms of design and designers, what do you have any favorites? Is there anyone we should check out? Uh, either contemporary or, you know, when you were, when you were getting into design, who was your great, who was an influence? Uh, no, I, I, I'll, I'll defer that question because I know too many designers and then I'll start showing favorites and then I'll get all in trouble and about three-fourths of them are on this here okay. so they know who they are and I love them. Um, and, um, but I guess I, I would say um, two, two things I, I, will, I will shout out is um, Silas Monroe's uh, course on, uh, that they've put together with a large community on uh, the history of black designers and graphic design, like that's something totally awesome you should be uh, ha tap into. And then they're about ready to release one for um, Latinx um, designers. So um, those are some of the things that I think are really, really, again, exciting. I would uh, engage with like the People's History of Graphic Design, that website. And I'm really fascinated by... Um, different notions of curation and how we can have more, you know, like the people's history, Howard Zen, people's history. So the people's history of all of these different practices, I think are really important. And so engaging in those platforms, I think are going to be part of like the transformation that's happening. Um, so I'm inspired by my design students uh, every year. I'm inspired by my design faculty who continue to um, push themselves to explore how to be better instructors and how to position themselves in the world. I'm deeply inspired by the making that happens in community that doesn't get formally um, defined as design. Um, so I won't, like I said, I won't pick too many favorites because I'll get in trouble, but um, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm so lucky to be exposed to so much amazing making that's happening in the world mm -hmm. that it's impossible for me to not be inspired by everything I encounter. Well, talking about inspiration, um, who would you say have been your greatest influences? Um, <laughs> greatest influences. I'm dropping um, questions on you I now. Mean, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I would say uh, my uh, Aunt, Jalil, Aunt Jelaine Tunstall, who was the one who first took me to museums, uh, is definitely a major influence on my life and is the person that whenever I write, uh, there I try to write for her. Or if I give a presentation, she's my target audience. And so if she, uh, if my Aunt Jill uh, understands what it is I was trying to do, uh and found it interesting and engaging then i know i did it right <laughs> um so that's a big inspiration um rick Ruffay, so former executive director of aiga has been so pivotal in terms of like my own notion of leadership and modeling um sort of empathetic um and responsible <laughs> and responsive leadership um, so that's been a person who's been a big inspiration for me. Um, I mean, there's just so many, I, like, like, I think people understand it's like to get into this position, there are so many people who have to like support you and sponsor you and champion you and uh, believe in you and give you opportunities and make things possible that, um, again, you know, I am because <laughs> we are, right? Well, with that in mind then, would you have any, I don't know, um, advice for emerging scholars, people starting out on this path? 
Um, the thing I always tell to my students is like, find the thing that most you most want to change to make better in the world. Um, I always say it's like, what's yes, yes, yes. But what's the intervention that you want to make? And is that intervention needed? Is that intervention wanted? Does that intervention come from a place of exclusion? Maybe your own sense of exclusion. And so how would you bring you and your communities into this dialogue, into this engagement? So, um, and so I guess it's like the, the version of like, find your passion, but I think finding your passion um, is about what's internal to you. And what I love about design, right? Is like design is yes, what's internal to you, but also how that connects to others. So in choosing kind of what what intervention you want to make that you're also focused on how that might impact others. And hopefully like it's a positive impact that you're having on others. Well, I think that is a wonderful place to end this conversation. <laughs> I uh, thank you very much for joining me today, Dory. It's been an absolute pleasure um, chatting with you and we should definitely have to do this again. And uh, I hope to meet you in person at some point at one of these various design conferences that I'm sure we'll both be attending. Um, I wanna thank everyone who's joined in today. Um, and everyone do go and Google Dory, check out her work and also check out the 20th anniversary issue of the journal Art Design and Communication in Higher Education, um, which Dory guest edited, which is, which is all about this idea of decolonizing uh, art and design education. Um, so thank you and congratulations. And again, just thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a real pleasure. Great, be well, be safe. And to you, thanks so much. Okay.